friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not care. to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Jesus, Savior, is our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come with the Lord of prayer. knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend in Jesus. Blessed Savior, you have promised all our burdens you will bear may we ever Lord be bringing all to you in earnest prayer soon in glory bright unclouded faith Joyful praise in endless worship will be our sweet portion there. Oh, what a friend! Oh, what a friend in Jesus. Welcome to Walnut Grove Christian Church. Thanks for being part of our remote campus in the online world. Recently, I had a friend who invited me over to his house for the first time. Now, we had talked in coffee shops and in restaurants and gone for walks, kind of in his backyard in the woods. But this was the first time actually in those walls inside. And as he welcomed me into his kitchen and had me sit at the island, making me a cup of coffee, my eyes just naturally, like I'm kind of ADHD, and so I started kind of looking around, taking in the surroundings. And when he noticed my gaze, he said, yeah, you probably noticed I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of a, of a remodel. And he began to give me the Reader's Digest version, he called it, of a, knocked out a wall over here so the table could breathe. Why would he want to crush a kid against the other wall? So the table got moved out. We nixed the French doors over there, so... 
We could put in a huge specialty window that would flood the room with light. And he was right, over in the corner was this beautiful reading nook. You could just almost imagine having the sun soak into your skin as you turn the pages of an engrossing book. And then he kind of told me what was next. And it was clear that it would take some construction, some power tools. There would be some dust and disorder. But it was all part of a greater vision. It was all about bringing something greater to completion. See, today, as we near the end of our series and the end of the Bible, we're building towards an amazing remodel, reveal in the series called He Reigns Through Revelation. So hopefully this series has been part reminder that Christ walks among his church, present, powerful, and accounted for. Hopefully this has been part challenge, that in a divided world where allegiances seem to get frayed, your job, my job, is to worship the Lamb, resist the beast, and live today in light of eternity. Hopefully this has been partly about giving hope, seeing new life that comes even through death, victory that comes even through defeat, purpose that comes even through struggle. And today, as we enter into Revelation chapter 21, we find that after a dragon, beast, tribulation, and Armageddon, that all the dust and disorder, all the power tools and reconstruction were part of a greater vision, building towards something that we can call complete begins with an unveiling of new heaven and new earth. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had passed away. Verse 5, the one on the throne adds this, I am making everything new. All right, we get this newness promised. Now, new is an interesting word. Dictionary.com 12 unique entries, Webster's Dictionary, 13 or 14 unique entries. But in the Greek, we need to focus in on two major words for the new. The first is neos. It's typically used to describe something brand new. And so, right, if you went to your favorite clothing store and you picked up a brand new pair of jeans, that's neos. Or if my wife blindfolded me and took me out to the driveway and lovingly revealed a brand new rocks or off-road all-terrain vehicle, wink, wink, if you're listening, it's neos, brand new, off the lot. But there's a second Greek word for new that's more important for us today. It's kainos. Kainos isn't brand new. Kainos is going to Habitat store and picking up something that's already been used but is new to you. It's going to goodwill and picking up what's new to you, but not new to the world. Or it's a remodel. It's something that's fresh and updated. It's a development, an opportunity. And in this passage, amazingly, in Revelation, when God says, I'm going to make everything new, he's saying, I'm not going to make everything brand new off the lot. He says, I'm going to restore what was to what should be. It's God promising Refinement, restoration, remaking, making everything kainos. And this should rock us because the goal suddenly doesn't become rapturing in a rocket ship off earth to heaven. Becoming a partner with God on earth. In Christianity Today, their publication, Wendy Zoba confronted this tension head on with her middle son, Ben. It heard more than a few sermons on the new life in Christ, giving your life to Christ, surrendering your life in Christ, heaven waiting. And Ben seemed well attuned to the Christian life, a heart for God. He seemed to exhibit selflessness and kind tendencies. But Ben seemed stubbornly resistant to the invitations. He wouldn't give any explanation Right, his kind of preschool language, all he could say was, no, nah, not now. And he did this way constantly for a couple months, just constantly kind of stubbornly resistant to a conversation, stubbornly resistant to the acceptance. And then one morning, eating Cheerios at the breakfast table, 
Little Ben announced to his parents that he was ready to give his life to Christ. And then without conversation, he got up, left the table, and walked up the stairs. Wendy and her husband looked at each other, kind of in shock, jaws dropped, and they decided they were going to follow him. What's going on with this kid? And they weren't sure what to expect. Maybe to see him hands folded on his knees, praying by the bedside, some angelic moment. But that's not what they found. Instead, there was Ben folding up his Star Wars pajamas and placing them in the Sesame Street suitcase. Ben, what are you doing? He answered, packing. Why? To go to heaven. Then they understood. Then it made sense why he hesitated to the new life in Christ. He thought that in doing so, he'd have to leave his parents, leave his home, leave his school, leave everything behind, leave earth to be with Jesus in heaven. See, Ben, beautifully in that childlike faith, was ready to surrender everything to follow Jesus, but he thought to do so that he had to leave earth. He thought he was just getting ready for some life off this planet. See, maybe you've flirted with what we could call a castaway theology. A a, a faith that says, it's all about what's happening in heaven. It's all what's happening after I die, rather than what's happening right now here on earth. Like the movie with Tom Hanks, when he plays the sole survivor of a FedEx plane crash in the South Pacific. And he's on this island trying to constantly worry about what do I eat? What do I sleep? Shelter, safety, But in the back of his mind, really, there's only one question. When can I cast away, cast off this deserted island? All right, it's not completely deserted. You know Wilson, the volleyball, is with him. But he starts trying to build this raft, right? He wants to do everything in his power to cast off where he is so he can go somewhere else. I meet Christians like that sometimes. They've checked the box. They've said the prayer. They've done what they feel like they have to do, and now they're ready to cast off this world that gives them trouble, this world that's confusing, this world that doesn't always go the way they want, and they have this cast away mentality, this theology. It's all about heaven, doesn't matter here on earth. But it's imperative that when we look to Jesus, when we hear his words here, that he takes us away from a cast away theology to a kanos theology. When he says, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. He has a kenos theology for you, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. God tells the world, even for you, world that's broken and sometimes explosive and dangerous and storms rage, he says, there's even kenos for you. In Romans 8, he says, the world itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. The world even says, I need Kanos, Lord. See, when you think of faith, are you focused on the life to come or being part of the transformed life? See, the transformed life here begins to have implications that sometimes may make us a little uncomfortable. It begins to have implications on how we care for the environment around us, right? I'm not talking about hugging trees to hug trees, but man, if this is God's creation, he wants to make it new and we're called to be part of that, maybe we need to think about our actions. It has implications how we take care of other people. If this isn't about me getting my golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory in the heavens, gosh, maybe I need to think about them first. So we begin to find this powerful implication of a first remodel reveal, a new heaven and a new earth. But God's not done. In fact, this new heaven and new earth becomes new because of what I call a divergence and a convergence, right? A pulling away from and a drawing near to something else. Here's the second part of verse one and following. And there was no longer any sea. It's important. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. See, throughout Jewish tradition and throughout Revelation, the sea has stood for evil, chaos, the churning unrest of life here. But if you follow the progression through Revelation, you find something pretty intriguing. In Revelation 4, 6, we find the sea in God, near God is clear as glass. But it still exists. In Revelation chapter 14, we find the 144,000 are pictured as standing right next to the sea, but it's calm, but still capable. A challenge to the church to be right on that edge all right, right on the edge of evil, trying to bring it under control. But here in Revelation chapter 21, the progression comes to completion as we find that finally the sea, the churning, the evil, where the Leviathan live, where people disappear into the great unknown, is finally over. The new heavens and the new earth are new because evil and chaos are pulled away in this divergence from his people. But it meets this convergence as well. Verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, John says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a high, great a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So we have a divergence from evil and chaos and a convergence with a God who says, man, finally I'm with my people like a husband with his bride, both saying I do, and they become one, glued together. See, but there's this, sometimes this question that comes up is, this new Jerusalem, this bride, a people or a place? Revelation chapter 11 seems to make the case that the holy city is different than the great city of Jerusalem. That that great city of Jerusalem is actually tied to places like the great Babylon or Sodom and Gomorrah, a place of corruption and idolatry. And so there's something more going on here that we have to understand. In fact, this passage reminds me of something I read about in the history of Columbia. Columbia has this special place in my heart and my life as we've adopted three of our daughters from Columbia. And I remember reading about the early explorers who were obsessed with finding the mythical city of El Dorado, right? the city of gold, the, the golden one. See, but what they found looking back is that El Dorado was never an actual place per se. It was a person. It was a part of a people. Specifically, it was the leader of the native Muisca people whose inauguration was made official with a shower of pure gold dust. And so you'd find if you were at this amazing, like a fly in the forest, the jungle, you would see this leader, this chieftain, high in the Andes, the Muzika people all around as he stood on a wooden raft in this very unusually round green lake. And with his warriors all around him bearing the tribal banners, they would pour this gold dust over him. And impossibly, the new leader glowed like gold. A shining man covered from head to toe in gold dust. See, the golden city that people searched for was actually a golden people. See, I'd argue that we're meant to do the very same thing. That when God describes heaven using gold like he does, in the city of all gold, that what he's trying to get across is not what the city is actually made of, but what the people are defined by. That New Jerusalem has less to do with geography and more to do with relationship than we ever really stop and think about. It's saying the endemic fall, the treasure that we had in the garden, that brokenness is reversed. It's saying sin's separating power is crushed under the weight of a new kingdom coming. 
Think of it like Wiley Coyote crushed by the anvil as he chases the roadrunner. He says, listen, man, his weight has come and it's crushing what was there before. But the question becomes, how do we as Christ followers begin to glow? If Jesus is the golden one, right? This son, the Messiah who comes into the world that defeats death, that transforms, even that renews our mind, how do we glow? Moses had this problem and he would be in God's presence up in Mount Sinai and he would literally glow and they needed a lampshade for his face, a veil to cover things up, his wife's elbow in a bed. Turn off the light, Moses. Jeez, trying to sleep here. See, but we don't need Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer noses. God lets us glow when we go to him in prayer and get to hear his voice. When we dive into his word, not just to check off the chapter in our Bible reading, but we begin to see the power of God's word impacting our life. We meditate on it. We chew on it like a dog chewing a bone. We get to glow when we let the Holy Spirit have residence inside of us and begins to talk to us and talk us through to coach us to be more like Jesus Christ. See, when we look for El Dorado, the land, we miss El Dorado, the people. A people who don't have to, right? We don't have to go out and find gold dust to sprinkle on ourselves or shower over us. But we have a kingdom coming that's described with streets that says the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. The meaning of this is is important. In fact, this is one of my favorite verses because of its application. It means that our greatest treasure on earth, right, when people leave everything and go west for gold. The treasure that people fight for and kill for. He's saying the greatest treasure here on earth is nothing but heaven's dustiest row. He's like, what you're getting is such great value. See, this should make us as Christians the most generous people on the planet. We shouldn't have to talk at church about people giving faithfully to God because why would we hold on to anything that we have if God's gift, if God's kingdom coming is so much greater? So we wouldn't have to talk about prayers being a waste of time because we're talking to the one who comes in a place that doesn't even need a sun, a gaseous ball to provide light because he is light. He's power. More powerful than the sun itself. It means that our love here on earth isn't a waste or weakness, but in fact is preparation for a life that is better. It's why Paul said, man, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Why? Because faith becomes unnecessary. Hope becomes as pointless as a hula hoop. I've never been able to figure them out. But he says love, man, that's where it's at. You're going to get to experience it fully, completely. You don't have to wait anymore. It's here. See, it's in the true Eldorado that Christ makes his people glow like gold. So it's time for you to glow. So we've had this remodel reveal. We have a new heaven and new earth. We have a divergence of chaos and a convergence with our God. But there's one more event that makes this reveal, this remodel complete. It's the end of death. Martin Druger and Bill O'Reilly wrote a continuing book series. Maybe they still are. It's called Killing, and then they put a name in there. Killing Kennedy, killing Reagan, killing Hitler, killing Patton, even killing Jesus. And they track the historical story from life to death with all the twists and turns along the way. But here we get the very last edition. Killing death. The only funeral that deserves absolutely zero mourners. Revelation chapter 21, second part of verse 3. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be, here it is, no more death. Or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. See, these are words of the greatest funeral message ever delivered in human history. 
See, despite the fact that 2.4 million funerals took place in 2020, despite the billions of funerals that have taken place across the millennium, despite the bodies left to be eaten by birds or in shallow graves, this is the funeral message that gives hope to every single person who's died. That there will be a time when death itself dies. Where the mourning is done. Where the tears that flow like a water fountain or a waterfall are over. Where the pain that hurts so deeply and so fully that time passes but the pain doesn't will. It's finally a funeral that allows us to see the winner declare. Like a boxing match after it's done and the judge finally holds up the arm of the man who's victorious. Paul says, death, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? In other words, you don't have it. You lost. I know you've won 107 billion you've killed over human history, but you picked the wrong one in Jesus. Finally, the funeral comes that allows the vision of God's victory to come complete. A new heaven and a new earth where God and his people commune together. Where the old order is gone and God says, Kenos has come. Newness has come. Philip Yancey, in his book, The Questions That Never Go Away, pointed out how many approach funerals and death differently. Maybe you're listening today and you say, you know, Stephen, I don't believe in this whole afterlife thing. Maybe you're a naturalist. All you believe in is what you can see, hear, touch, taste, right? what you can calculate or probe. And so maybe you're waiting for the sun to be blown out like a match and for the planet, everything on it to go extinct. There's others like Japanese Buddhists who anticipate a time when the soul dies, losing its identity and merging with the oneness of the universe. See, but Christians, we place our hope in this idea, a time when the Bible calls the last enemy is defeated, where death will be destroyed. A time where God will sort out evil from good and life from death and take the resurrected bodies and the souls in a final resolution. As Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. You have to recall the power of of this hope in Christ to overcome the enemy of death when he attended a funeral of a child in Chicago. The pastor shocked mourners by glancing down at the funeral. His eulogy got interrupted and he just looked at this casket with this young boy laying there and he screamed out, Damn you, death! Damn you! Not exactly your normal funeral message. But he caught himself and he said, listen, I'm not damning God, I'm damning death. And God too has promised to damn death. See, ironically, by dying on the cross, the good news that came from bad moment was that Jesus made death a dying breed. See, death isn't just restrained here. Death is eradicated. Death is damned to the hell that it came from. And so no matter how badly death has hurt you, no matter how fully death has ravaged those around you. In the face of death, time and time again, I go back to the words of English poet John Doon, his sonnet called Sonnet X, which says, Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Be not proud. See, death once dressed in the remnants of every king and queen, seemingly possessing all the power of dictators and despots, seemed to be armed with every buried treasure and trinket, fueled by every lost dream, so powerful that could even lead Jesus to be mocked and humiliated down the road to Calvary. But little did death know that the road that now strips death that is the road that crucifies death. It's the road that leaves death without a resurrection. 
death be not proud. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Why? Because Jesus is making all things kenos. Building in the midst of dust and disorder, in the midst of power tools and construction, a picture that will be complete. He's building to something that will be ready for his people. And so today, man, you didn't know it, but you've just attended, hopefully, is a funeral that we'll all get to attend and not cry and not mourn, but celebrate. And so as God prepares this new world for us, this remodel reveal, the question is, are you ready? Are you looking for heaven or are you ready to start engaging with God here on earth? Have you started to embrace the divergence from evil and a convergence with the power of God through the Holy Spirit here now? through his word now, through prayer now. And are you ready to start living beyond death? If you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, feel free to reach out to us. Let's have that conversation and begin preparing for the remodel reveal. God bless you guys. Take care. Talk to you soon.